You know, I love when I meet someone and maybe hadn't seen them for a while and they look at me and they smile. This means they recognize me. I don't know about you, but I wake up to a smile every morning because my God has smiled on me. That means he knows me. Not just about me, he knows me. And he's been good. Has God been good to anybody? Welcome, welcome to our worship service this morning. We just are thankful to God and to you, those of you who are viewing our services, for allowing us into your home. We just thank you uh, to those who are first time guests. We want you to just uh, come in, in and say, I'm a first time, first time in, and we just uh, appreciate you. Uh, to those who have continued to pray and encourage us, we thank God for you and we're praying for you. And to the Trinity Gardens Church family, we love you, thank you for your continued diligence and your support as we navigate through this period, this season, they call COVID. But listen, if God brings you to it, God will bring you through it. And somebody ought to say amen to that. Has God brought anybody through something? So we thank you. Thank you for being here with us. In the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, from the message translation, Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the west end of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God, Horeb. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire, blazing, burning out of the middle of the bush. He looked and the bush was blazing away, burning, and it did not burn up. Moses said, what's going on here? Have you ever had a time in your life when God was working? You say, what's going on here? I don't understand it. I didn't see it coming, but God is moving. God is moving. So he said, what's going on here? This is amazing. Why doesn't the bush burn up? And I just want to talk a little bit from the subject. The burning. The burning. You know... When we visited this text at Exodus, and we've been in and out of Exodus, I, I tried to get out and stay out, but the Holy Spirit keeps bringing me back. Because there's something in here, something in here. You know, if the Holy Spirit keeps taking you back to something, to a text, that's something the Holy Spirit wants you to get. And it brings me, and every time we visit, we see that God's people were in confinement. They were in confinement against their will. When you are confined, that means that you are limited. Um, you have limited access to the blessings that God has for you. You're restricted. We use the term bondage, slavery, but it's confinement. And I'm talking about this because if you're a child of God, you will go through a season of confinement. Um, Joseph was confined to a pit and later to a prison. Elijah was confined to a cave. Paul and Silas were confined to a prison. Uh, Joseph also was confined to a dysfunctional family. And before you look at anybody else's family, just look in the mirror. All of our families have some dysfunctionality in it. And if your family doesn't, then you need to be in heaven. And sometimes you're confined into dysfunctionality. And so confinement, confinement is, 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 is something that we all have to deal with. And we are restricted. We're restricted. And God said, I want to let my people go. I want to let my people go because I want my people to be free. But see, what Pharaoh did to God's people here, see, it's easy to confine you if I first define you. Now, in the text in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 11, he said, 
they are slaves. See, he defined them. He de see, if I can define you, I can confine you. See, so he defined them. And what Satan does, he wants to define us, to confine us. They tried to do it with Jesus. They called him a false prophet. They called him a demon. They called him an illegitimate child. They tried to define him. They called him Beelzebub. You know, that's an ugly word, Beelzebub. It's a demonic. It, it's the Lord of the flies. Literally, it's, a, it's not the devil. It's the chief devil. And because they wanted to confine his influence and confine him, they called him ignorant. And they wanted to confine him and see if a person can, con can define you, they can confine you. Last year, um, 2019 marked 400 years since people of color were brought into uh, the coast of Virginia as slaves. And we struggled with that all those years. But during all those years, one of the things that has happened, not just to us, but people who were not part of the dominant culture, they were defined, violent. Don't want to work. Thieves. Let's define them. Slaves. And then so if we can define you, then guess what? I can confine you to a certain place because I don't want you with me. See, if you are violent and you would steal and you're a rioter, you riot and tear stuff down, and if I can define whole groups of peaceful people like that, then guess what? I don't want you in my suburban neighborhoods. I don't want you in my elite schools. You can't be the CEO of a major company because I have defined you, and by defining you, I can confine you. I can define your children early. I can define your boys and define them as troublemakers and then put them in a category and make them live with that label all their lives. And when they get old enough, I can confine them in prison. Because, see, I've defined you. And you got to be careful about movies and TVs and radio stations and cable news that try to define us so that they can confine us. Because you don't belong here. Because you are different, you are deficient. You are not like us. I have defined you. But I'm so glad that I was defined by my creator. I am the son of the most high God. You are a daughter of royalty. You're a king. You're a priest. Your daddy owns the cattle of a thousand hills. He owns the hills, the dirt, the grass, the cows, and even the mineral rights underneath the dirt. That's my daddy, and that's who defines me. And so that's why we cannot let TV, movies, the news, and pictures define us and our children. Because when they can define you, they can confine you. And so what they did here at Exodus, since they defined the Jews, they put them in a, what we call a ghetto situation. In Exodus chapter 1, because they said there are slaves in chapter 11, guess what they did? They put them in this area called Pithon and Ramesses, which is where the slaves lived. The first ghetto is in the Bible. Now the word ghetto actually comes from Italy, in Venice where they put the Jews in an area where the poor folk lived. And it was the ghetto. Because, see, they had defined the Jews, and so now they confined the Jews. And so when racism was imported to North America, they did the same. Listen, the playbook hadn't changed. It hadn't changed. The devil is using the same playbook. And that's why we will not, as children of God, we will not let nobody but our creator define us. And then, but the problem comes is not when other people define us, it's when we take that definition and put it on ourselves. 
It is when it gets in our mind and our spirit and we say we are violent, lazy, stupid, ignorant. And we define ourselves and talk about each other. And so what God does after the devil tries to define us and confine us, God comes along and says, I'm going to refine you. You know, we got a lot of oil companies here in Houston and we have refineries. And when the oil comes out of the ground, it's called crude oil. It's crude because it has impurities in it. Because it's been in the ground so long, it's got impurities. It's fossil fuel that comes from dead stuff. And some of us have been in the ground so long, we've been beat over and talked about and defined by evil, broken people that God has got to dig deep and bring us out of the ground. And then he refines us, takes us through a divine refinery. And what a refinery does, it separates the impurities. And he detoxes us. You get a spiritual detox. And then once a refinery refines the crude, oil is no longer crude and you have gasoline kerosene, butane, ethane, methane, when it goes through the refinery. So God said, I want you to be free. John chapter 8 and 36, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Because see, if man free you, he'll go back and get you. I love what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 16. I love that. If you, I'm going to just turn that for just a moment. In 1 Peter 2, look what Peter said, a man who knew something about bondage. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 16, Peter said, live as free people. See, some folk are free, but they live in like slaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You out of the jail house, but you walk around in your jail suit. Oh. You, you. You free. So Peter had to remind Christians, you free. Live like it. Sometimes churches need to be free from the bondages of human tradition. We did it like that in 1955. Can't we do it like that now? And you need to be free. But look what he said. Live as free people. Now, you have to be freed from in order to be free to. So you need to be free from shame, yeah. guilt, yeah. regret, yeah. low self-esteem, yeah. ignorance, yeah. poverty. Yeah. He frees us from Hershey yeah. to free us to, yeah. to free us to love, to dream, yeah. to build, to forgive. He frees you from to free you to. So here we are in the book of Exodus. In the book. And by the way, in that text, Peter said, show proper respect to everyone. When you are freed from bigotry and resentment, then you can respect everybody. No matter what the gender, no matter what the color of their skin, no matter whether they're walking around in a thousand dollar suit or tall jeans, barefooted. Everybody's equal at the foot of the cross. And nobody is better than anybody else. I don't care if you been, was born in the church and been going all your life and there's somebody that never put foot in a church, you are no better than that person. All of us were created by God. And wherever you are, you are there by the grace of God. Period. And so going back to the book of Exodus, Exodus, he wants us to be free. So God said, I got to get my people free. I want to say to somebody, God wants you to be free. And maybe you watch me right now and you're in bondage to worry, addiction, resentment. You're still in bondage from what your, your grandmama said about you when you were eight years old. And that still weighs heavily on you. So God did three things to free him. And listen, he does these three things to free us. He sent a prophet. He spoke of his promise. And then he showed his power. 
and to free you today from whatever you in, God's going to send you a prophet. And he's going to speak of his promises. And then he's going to show you his power. Has anybody watching me right now ever seen the power of God? I want to know. You can chime in right now. Let, tell God something. Say, I've seen his power. I know what God can do. He gave me a job when I was broke. He got me up from a sick bed. God is a powerful God. And sometimes when you're in bondage, you need to see his power. But first of all, he's going to send you a prophet. Now, now, a prophet, I did some teaching on this a couple of years ago. But the word prophet means to speak forth. Okay, now, people think of a prophet as somebody who can foretell the future. Well, some prophets could do that. But the basic meaning of the word is to speak forth. A prophet of God will speak the word of God. That's all it means. To speak for it. Now, in the Bible, there are two types of words, messages that the prophets would speak. That's called the Logos word and the Rhema word. Well, you say, preacher, what's the difference? The Logos word is God's generic word. Word. 2 Timothy 2.15, King James, study to show thyself. Give diligence to show thyself. Approved unto God. When I was in the kindergarten, my mama taught me as my first memory scripture, this scripture. Study to show thyself. Give diligence to show thyself. Approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the logos the word of truth. Now that's God's generic word. So he said you got to study it. That's, God's, that's what, the, what the generic word is. It says that love everybody. Be kind to everybody. Care about people. That's the logos word. But now the rhema word gets a little bit stickier. The rhema word is when God speaks to your specific situation. Now, the Logos word says love everybody. Yeah. But preacher, how do I love that person that has continually stabbed me in the back? I may be living with them every day. It may be a child. It may be a relative. It may be a spouse. It may be a co-worker who continuously does everything they can to hurt me. How do I love him? How do I love her? I don't need a logo. I need a rhema word. I need something specific to that situation. And in the Bible, in the Old Testament, God sent prophets who gave the rhema word. They spoke to God's people's specific problems. Now, in the book of Mark, you see an example, 14 of the rhema word, a specific word. You remember when Peter told Jesus, he said, Jesus, I'll die for you. And the Bible says he put on his makara, that sword. Because yeah. Peter said, I will cut somebody for you. Yes, sir. I will cut. Some of y'all got some friends like that. Oh, yeah. they, 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 thank God they have ride or die friends, but you know, you got to tame some of that sometimes. They say, oh, I'll cut somebody. I'll cut somebody. And that's what Peter did. And you know what I love about the Bible? Those people were not superhuman. They were not super believers. They were just like us. They failed, they made mistakes, they had doubt, they worried, they fight, they cuss, they cut. But guess what? God still used them. God still used them. And so when you read the Bible, don't read, oh, these were super believers. These were super Christians. They were just like us. They got discouraged. They cried. They wanted to give up. But God still used them. Peter's told Jesus, I will die for you. And Jesus said, Peter, first of all, you have no idea what you're saying. You don't know what's coming. You don't know what's, what you're going to run into. You're saying that you will die for me. You'll stand by me. You're my ride or die. Before the rooster crows three times within a couple of hours, you're going to tell folk you don't even know me. And Peter said, ain't going to happen. Jesus didn't say anything. And the Bible says in verse 72, it happened just like Jesus said. But the text said, then Peter remembered the rhema. 
the specific word for his specific situation. And so when a prophet comes, God is going to send them a prophet that's going to give them a word for that specific situation. And I want to tell you something. If you're a child of God in here, God will send people to you who can speak to your specific situation. It may be a big brother who knows God. It may be your mama. It may be that grandmama say, baby, let me tell you what God can do. It may be your Sunday school teacher. It may be your pastor. It may be your preacher. It may be your shepherd. It may be just a good Sunday school teacher. It may be a family member. But God will send you somebody. It may be a godly Christian-based counselor. But he's going to send you a prophet. Now, remember, prophet is not necessarily miraculous. I'm not talking about somebody who can tell the future, but it's a person God has spoken to them because they know God. And God said, I want them to give a word to you based on their experience and their knowledge of God's word. They call that pastoral counseling. But let me tell you something. A prophet can't really get you delivered unless he's experienced deliverance himself. He cannot. And so if you look at Exodus, Moses went through his experience. The Bible says that uh, Pharaoh wanted to kill all the male boys, all the, all the males, all the male babies. And you remember the story. We've talked about it before. To save his life, his mother put him in this little, little basket and then little basket and put it in the Nile River. And it floated down past all those alligators. All them alligators floating down the Nile. And Moses' big sister Miriam was just watching, watching, watching. And I want to tell somebody, even when you don't think nobody's watching over you, God is watching over you. And she watched it, watched him. He couldn't even watch over himself. And finally, Pharaoh's daughter found him. And then when she found him, she pulled him out. And you know the story. She asked Pharaoh, she asked Moses' sister, can you find an, a, a Hebrew to nurse this Hebrew baby? And then she went and got Moses' mama. Ain't God good? God can work things out. But then Moses grew up in the house of Pharaoh. Yeah. He wore the finest clothes. Yeah, yeah. He ate the best food. He didn't eat bologna sandwiches. Yeah. He didn't eat that, or mayonnaise sandwiches. Yeah. He had the finest imported food. Yeah, yeah. He went to the best universities in the world. Even now, in Northern Africa and Egypt, they have some of the best universities in the world. He was trained. He was an eloquent speaker. He had great opportunity. But here's what I want you to get. His opportunity came out of his adversity. Where there is adversity, there is opportunity. Where there is adversity, there is opportunity. Some of you are going through adversity right now. I'm telling you, out of your adversity, God will always provide an opportunity. When Jesus was with his disciples on the Sea of Galilee, that was a storm on the sea. It came up. Adversity. He used that as an opportunity to teach them about faith. When Mary and Martha had to bury their brother Lazarus and Jesus came to the grave, out of that adversity, he taught them that I'm not just a healing God, I'm a resurrecting God. Out of adversity, there's opportunity. In uh, 20, a, two years ago, 2018, Stacey Abrams ran for governor of the state of Georgia. Brilliant, brilliant Yale-educated attorney. She was so smart that at 17 years old, she was writing speeches for congressional candidates. Brilliant. And she, and she did something no one has ever done before. She had served in the legislature, but now she ran for governor of Georgia. Yeah. That deep south redneck yeah. state. Yeah. People told her, don't do it. You can't do it. She said, I'm going to run. Mm. Problem was, the man she was running against, Brian Kemp, was the secretary of state. So the man she was running against was the man who was responsible for counting the votes. She said, how can the man who's responsible for counting and overseeing the voting be also a person who's a candidate? He ought to give it up. But then they did something to stop her. Brian Kemp removed over a period of several years over 1.4 million voters from the Georgia 
ver voter registration rolls. He also removed several hundred thousand more because he said they didn't vote in the last election. Then he did something else. He closed hundreds of voting precincts, mostly in minority areas. Stacy said, this is wrong. Nobody listened because the powers that be controlled that state. And even with all that adversity, Stacey Abrams still came within a few thousand votes of becoming governor of the state of Georgia. In her speech after that election two years ago, she said this is not a concession speech. Because a concession speech means I'm saying that you did something right. You are not right. What you did was wrong. She said, but I'm not going to whine about it. And you know what she did? She set up an organization against unfair voting. And for the past several years, this was just a couple years ago, she has registered almost a million new voters in Georgia. In addition, all the new people who moved to Georgia, all the people in Atlanta around the suburbs, black, white, brown, she trained people to get people to see the power of voting. Because, see, if you don't vote, you have no voice. And if you have no voice, people will do anything to you. And she educated people. She trained people. She educated the candidates. And then a few days ago, Georgia did something nobody thought they'd do. Georgia voted for Democrats for the first time in 30 years and they took that pattern of Stacey Abrams and they did the same thing in Michigan and they did the same thing in Wisconsin. Out of, and this is not about black and white, it's not about Democrat or Republican, it's about out of adversity, there's an opportunity. And you don't go into a hole and have a pity party, you get up and say, where's the opportunity? And listen, what she did didn't just bless her, she blessed somebody else. And so here is Moses, out of adversity. And somebody's watching me right now, and you got some adversity in your life. Money problems, family problems, sickness. If you live, you will face adversity. In this life, get ready, it's coming. Adversity has your name on it, it's coming. But I'm telling you, out of adversity, God has given a twin to adversity, and it's called opportunity. I have a friend of mine lost his job a few years ago. They just called him in and said, you fired. He had done nothing wrong. You know what he did? He started his own trucking company. Then he started buying houses on the side. He's a multimillionaire right now. And he told me, I think he told me one time, he said, Tim, if I had to, I'd tell that boss, thank you. And somebody ought to tell adversity, thank you. Because with it comes opportunity. And Stacey Abrams. And so, if you look at the story though, within, the Bible said, but Moses had this burning within him. He was a deliverer. He had the gift. And there's some of you watching me right now. God has put something within you. And the Bible says that as he grew up, he grew up an Egyptian, but his heritage was Hebrew. And for 40 years, he did not have to make a choice. But when he got 40 years old, he had to make a choice. And when he made the choice, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 2, you know the story, he saw an Egyptian brutalizing a Hebrew. And then that gift rose up in him. Because it had always been there. And it rose up. And he went and he wound up killing the Egyptian, burying him in the ground, hiding it and lying about it. But see, that fight, that fight between the Egyptian and the Hebrew symbolized the battle within him. The Hebrew in him. That's what his mama was and his daddy was. The Egyptian in him, that's who adopted him and raised him. And that was that battle. Who are you going to stand with? Who are you going to stand with? And he didn't have to make a choice till he got 40 years old. And God is telling somebody right now who's watching me, you got to make a choice. And then, and, and then the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting. And then something interesting happened. The Bible said that 
when Moses again that that flame that burning that deliverer see Moses always looked out for the underdog the outcast the vulnerable that's his gift I want to deliver those who have no deliverance anywhere else and some of you, you have a burning, a gift within you to serve, to build, to dream, maybe to help children, maybe to help seniors, maybe to reach out in the community and build a community. That's a burning within you to minister to people with your gift that you have. That is a burning. Maybe you're a songwriter and that's a burning. That's a gift within you. And that gift is showing up. But when it showed up, the next day, he tried to break it up, and you know what they said? Who made you boss? And Moses loved them. Have you ever loved somebody who turned on you? Have you ever tried to help somebody who hurt you? What happens when you love them, but you can't lift them? And what was happening, the haters were coming out. See, what he didn't know. See, when you have a gift, get ready for the haters. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Haters going to hate. Hate, hate. They're going to hate. And people look at you, and sometimes they look at where God has brought you, and they become haters, and they jealous, and they assume that your blessings just dropped out of heaven. Because you got maybe a nice car, a nice job, or you look nice. And they just assume. But what they don't know, they don't know how many alligators you had to float past. They don't know you had to float past some alligators. The nights you stayed up crying, the times you struggled, the hard work, the double time, the triple time, the time people knock you down, saying you will never come back, you won't be anything. They don't know the adversity. And they just look at your gift, and that's what they did at Moses. They looked at Moses, and they said, who made you? And you know what God will do sometimes? God will cause your enemy to speak your destiny. Who made him? Who put him in charge? God did. That's right. That's right. Your enemy won't even know it. And what happened was his gift was disrespected. And then his gift was rejected. And then because of the rejection, he went into the wilderness. He married a, a, a Midianite. He started a family. His gift was neglected. But then in chapter 3, God said your gift is selected because the flame is still there. And let me tell the story. I know I don't have much time, but he, the Bible says in chapter 3, Moses was walking in the wilderness. He had a family. He had married Zipporah. He had a bunch of kids, and, and he was working for a priest. He had everything going good, but God said, I ain't through with you yet. I ain't through with you. That flame is still there, and he saw a bush burning. Now, there's nothing unusual about that. Because in the desert, when it's hot, bushes catch on fire. That happens in, in California. It happens in West Texas. But what was unusual, he walked by the bush and he kept looking and it didn't burn up. So Moses turned around and looked at the bush. Here's what happened. He looked at the bush, but what he didn't know, the bush was looking at him. Because God was in the bush. He looked at the bush and said, the bush is on fire. Yeah. The bush looked at him and said, you on fire. Because that gift is still in you. He looked at the bush and said, you are not consumed. The bush said, you ain't either. You ain't either. Your gift of deliverance, that gift that God put within you, it's still there. It's still there. And then he did this. And then he looked at him. And he said, it's burning inside. It's burning inside. And then he said to him, he said, listen, other people have tried to extinguish your gift. And there are people who try to extinguish your gift. You tried it. And maybe you failed. They say, you never should have tried it in the first place. You try to do something. They say, you won't be able to do it. You can't finish school. You can't get that degree. You'll never start that business. They try to stay with you. Nobody don't want to hear you. They can't use you. You remember what you did when you were 19 years old? You spent some time in jail. Who want a jailbird doing something for God? You remember what you did? You remember your mistakes? You remember this and that? You remember you did this, you did that? They'll try to extinguish your gifts. 
And then they would try to get you. That's what happened to Moses. And then they would try to get you to relinquish your gift. But God said, I have distinguished your gift. And you know what? They can't kill it. And so he said, Moses, Moses. I like that. Moses, Moses. It reminds me, he would say, Abraham, Abraham. Joshua, Joshua. Verily, verily. You know what that means? That means when Jesus said, it's covenant talk. That's a covenant. Jesus said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's saying, Moses, heaven said you got this gift. And what's happening on earth is what I said in heaven. It is a covenant. You cannot run from what I put inside of you. And I want to tell somebody right now, God has put a gift of flame inside of you. Don't let COVID-19 take it away. Don't let the haters squash it. Don't let the haters. Don't let what negative people say squash your gift and extinguish your gift. Don't let people bring up your past. In fact, this message is for somebody who's made some mistakes, who's struggled in the past, who's had a difficult time, who's been knocked down. I want you to know that God has put something special within you. And nobody can take it away. And heaven, you know, the Bible says in Psalm 62 and 11, it said God said it once, but I heard it twice. Because there's an echo. What he said in heaven is echoing from earth. And what you are doing, that flame that God has put within you, that fire, that gift, I know it's been down for a minute. I know you've had some setbacks. I know, but that ain't something that I was just saying on earth. God said it in heaven when he created you. And so, I'm going to say to you and leave with you what Paul told Timothy. Because you have this faith, I now, God sent me as your prophet this morning. I now remind you to stir up the fire which God gave you. And I want to stir up somebody right now. Don't give up that dream of having that daycare. Don't give up that dream of, of building that preschool or give up that dream of going back to school and serving in that ministry. Don't give it up. Don't give it up. And I know you've been set back. Listen, all of us have had some setbacks. Everybody been knocked down. In fact, I tell people, you don't have a message until you've been knocked down. You don't know what grace is until you've been knocked flat on your back and been in the valley and the shadow and felt abandoned. And then you look at yourself and you look at your, your brokenness. And see what God, and you know, it's interesting, when Moses got ready to deliver the people, the guy said, the guy said when he was rejected, he said, I, I know what you did the other day. The devil will always put somebody in your life to remind you of what happened way back young. But see, we have holiness and brokenness within us. And I'm so glad, no, let's get that God said, I'm going to look past your brokenness, Paul. And I'm the potter. And I can put it back together again. And when I put you back together again, it's going to be good as new. Has God ever put somebody back together again? We're getting ready to pray right now. We're getting ready to pray right now. I want you to put in your prayer request right now. Somebody who's watching me right now, you, you, you thought that your gift, your flame was dead. But I want to tell you right now that God wants to stir up the flame. God wants to keep it going. God wants to rejuvenate what you thought was buried. God wants to get it back again. And right now, maybe you're struggling. You, you've got some things weighing heavily on you. I want to just tell you right now that give it to God. You know, Jesus said one of my favorite passages. He said, cast, Peter said, cast all your cares. Everything you're worried about, everything you're worried about, give it to God. 
give it to God. I want you to put in that prayer request right now. I want you to do it as we sing, cast all your care up on the Lord. Up on the Lord. Cast all your cares. Up on the Lord. As we bring it down softly. I love that song. I love that song, and we're about to pray in just a moment. I just want to give you a chance to share your request. See, call us crazy, but we believe in prayer where we are. The only reason I can say for myself I'm standing here right now is because the prayers of the righteous. I thank God I had a praying mama, a praying daddy, a praying grandmama, saints who prayed for me. Prayer works, but you got to trust it. And that's why we're giving you time right now. Put that request in. But also, if you have a praise report, just say, I praise him and I thank you for what he's done. But cast everything to him right now. We're going to give you just a moment right now as we cast all our doubts, all our doubts, all our doubts. Cast all your doubts. Cast all your doubts. Up on the Lord, up on the Lord. Up on the Lord. Cast all of them, all of them. Your doubts, your doubts. Up on the Lord. Because he cares. right now that part of that song and we're about to pray right now but I think the Holy Ghost is about to move right now on yes, somebody yes. I love the part where he knows what you're going through yes, sir. Yes, sir. he knows stuff you can't tell your husband you can't tell your wife he knows what happened to you when you were five years old he knows the ugly things that you were bullied when you were in the seventh grade and you cried at night and here you are 40 50 years old and he knows yes, sir. He knows you are hurt. You are assaulted. And he knows. He knows. He knows. And he cares. Oh. And he's going to heal you. Cast off. Yeah. One more time. Yeah. Cast off. Cast, Cast off. Yeah. Up on the Lord. Oh. Sing it one more time. One more time. Yeah. Yes. One more time. Yeah.
And, and we're about to pray. I know some of you got, you may be watching. You say, well, preacher, I thought, well, you just end the sermon and be done. I could do that. But people are broken. And people are in the pit. And you don't attack people for being in the pit. You don't tear them down for being a pit. You pull them out of the pit. Come on, That's why they call this place a poor pit. You pull people out. <laughs> yes, sir. And I know because I've been there, done that. We're going to pray right now. We're going to pray right now. Father, 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 we love you. Father, we love you. As David said, as the deer pants and thirsts for the water, so our souls thirst for you in a dry and a desert place. And Father, so many times our lives feel like a desert place. We feel unappreciated, unloved, unwanted, uncared for, but thank God you care for us through your son, Jesus Christ. But, but, but Father, before we ask you for anything, we thank you for everything. You woke us up this morning. We're in our right mind. Somebody's, some people, their eyes are open, but they don't even know who they are, where they are. And you gave us a portion of our right mind, and we say, thank you, Jesus. We got a roof over our head, a pillar under our neck. Thank you to be able to see COVID takes away the sense of smell and taste. Thank you, we can taste. Thank you, we can smell. We can hear. But Father, thank you that you've taught us how to love and how to forgive. Father, thank you for bringing us through this election. Thank you. Father, we know you control everything. Yes. Pharaohs come and go. Hey. But our God is forever. And we say thank you. Father, guide this country in the months and the years to come. We pray for our current president-elect and the vice president. They're going to need all the grace and anointing that you could give them as they try to heal this country. And Father, those of us who are people of faith, we pray that people will see God in us. Because ultimately, we do not place our trust in princess. But our trust ultimately is in God. Father, go with those who are sick. We've got prayer requests that have come in. There are some who are facing illness. There are some who've lost their job. Some are struggling with their children. Father, we ask the Holy Ghost to go into every home, every heart where that prayer request is. And we ask that there be a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Father, we love you. We praise you. And we lift up the name of Jesus. And we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. The only name that matters in Jesus' name. And let all that believe say amen.